Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back uh, to the uh, to the studio. I can't quite say good morning or good afternoon because we're right in the middle, um, but it is a pleasure to welcome you in whatever time zone uh, you're joining us in. So we have a um, fascinating webinar today, just looking at uh, the top 100 retailers in the Nordic region, uh, a really vibrant uh, area full of some of the world's biggest brands and some of the world's most credible niche design-led, capable, sustainable brands, um, a, a fantastic uh, market. So um, it's a great pleasure that uh, it's not just me in the studio talking you through, but I'm joined by Michaela uh, from Klevu. So now that you've seen our photos, let's show the reality. Uh, Michaela, welcome to the studio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very, very much for having me, Ian. Very nice. Good. Well, look, I'm glad. I'm glad we have because you're just recovering from COVID. So uh, I appreciate you uh, dragging yourself to join us, um, and of much course. appreciate that. Uh, but we anyway, Michaela, uh, in case anyone doesn't know uh, about you or Claver, why don't you just tell us a, a bit about both, um, just to set the scene, please? Absolutely, yes. So um, let's start with the one that's clearly more interesting. So that would be Klevu. Uh, what we do, uh, my role there is a, a director of enterprise sales. I work in EMEA as a market. So I have quite a bit of background working uh, throughout all of the Nordic countries and then also seeing just the differences of how Nordics compare to, to the UK, Central Europe, uh, Middle East and all the way to Africa. Now, um, Klevu, for those of you who aren't that familiar yet, is a product discovery software. So what we offer really is a AI technology to boost your product discovery. We are uh, Mac certified, completely headless. So we work on basically any platform you could imagine. And um, we have thousands of clients currently live with our solutions. And uh, that is a growing number that I um, I take care of making sure that we that we increase. Great. And just uh, in case anyone's thinking product discovery, that sounds lovely. Um, what is it? So just give a, a, a layman's guide to, you know, is it search feeds, push uh, correlations? How do you see product discovery? So the way I see product discovery is really that once you actually land on an e-commerce site, we make sure to show the relevant products at the right time to the visitor on the site. So whether that is you know what you're looking for, you might use our search. That is a tool we offer. Uh, if you want to go and scroll, browse through collection pages, categories, we make sure that we always rank them in a way that they are most appealing to you as a buyer and they are most converting to you as a merchandiser. And then mm -hmm. we want to kind of round off the entire experience on that site with just really hyper relevant product recommendations right. that are personalized okay. and, um, and take into consideration also, uh, also previous historical data. Lovely. Well, I'm sure we'll pick up on data again because that runs uh, through all conversations today. Um, but looking at the, uh, lovely guest list on the webinar. Uh, we have a mix of people who are in the Nordic region. And so obviously we don't want to spend too much time just holding up a, a mirror to them, but a number of people who are um, outside the region and looking to get a bit of an insight. So I thought it was worth um, just talking a little bit first about the region. And this comes from um, the uh, RetailX Nordic Region Report, um, not so much the top 100. And, you know, I've always found it uh, slightly tricky to group countries into a thing called a region, which seems slightly uh, imposed from outside. So I thought I'd first of all show um, what we mean by uh, the Nordics. So um, we're looking at this group in uh, North and Northwest Europe, um, which comprises you know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, then Finland is a slightly smaller market and Iceland as well, um, mainly because I love visiting and this makes it a research trip uh, and so tax deductible. So we have, uh, we have these countries um, which cluster together and some of the things that ties them together as a region is the uh, ease of um, 
of selling across those borders and consistent, um, comparable demographics of the consumers uh, where if you ask them, they see themselves as part of a region, even though they are obviously independent countries. And um, it's also worth pointing out that these countries have um, quite a large spread in terms of geography and population. And so not only are there challenges talking about, you know, one country versus another, but you know, there's a big difference between, say, capital areas, urban, regional, uh, etc. So mindful of all of that, uh, this is still probably one of the most coherent um, regions we look at. And within the um, regional profile, uh, we can see that there's a very stable um, population um, across all age groups. So uh, unlike other countries which are perhaps being either aging or being driven by um, youthful booms, we have a stable uh, population uh, and we also have a slightly rising GDP uh, per capita, which is uh, great. So overall a relatively confident uh, area. And um, we, we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Uh, but I thought it was worth also point out the relative sizes of the economies. And what we see here is that uh, in the top chart, that the Swedish economy um, is definitely the largest uh, and perhaps uh, dominant one. Uh, and we're seeing a market that has um, is primarily focused on fashion, uh, very big representation of electronics, beauty and health. Uh, but with a significant chunk uh, on the furniture side as well. The other um, category that you see is really a representation of just how well-formed the market is and how uh, diverse it is um, as well. Um, but I, th I thought it was worth pausing uh, here, Michaela, and um, just talking a bit about uh, two things. One is the general commercial feel and attitude in the region. Virtually impossible to sum up, but uh, but let's um, try. And secondly, is this sort of characteristic that, um, that, that retailers very quickly have to become regional and international minded. So let, let's take that one, um, the, the second one first. Um, if a company, um, whether it's product led or customer and retailing format led, let's say you start in Finland, it sounds that before you've even finished your first year of trading, you're thinking, I'd better get myself into Sweden, Denmark, etc. So it seems if, uh, if if retailers here are sort of born with um, a, a near immediate regional cross-border selling approach, uh, is this me just being... Um, simplistic as I look uh, as I look from uh, the UK or do you think there is that certain vibe about cross-border and um, uh, and growth from the outset? Um, I think you're definitely onto something I mean that's probably one of those key things that I would really like highlight when I think about the Nordic region is two things it's the location and then it's the size so looking at just the location of of these countries if we look if we think back to that first map we saw we know that we are kind of up here in the north a bit more alone uh, so that's one thing I mean um, we have always had to work extra hard, for example, to offer the kind of um, shipping methods that you would see as completely standard in the UK and in, in, uh, in Central Europe, just because of the distances. And the second thing is size. So if we think about, let's say, Finland, for as an example, we are, um, I think, shy of 6 million people at the moment. London has over 8 million people living in it. So yes, very, very quickly do people need to actually start uh, getting into other markets just because very few are content having a business that is only uh, that is only striving um, mm. or thriving in one market. Uh, then yep. we also have the language differences, which I think is very important to point out. It is if you you build an e-commerce store in the UK, for example, you start with an English site. You can very easily just go expand that, make it an EU-wide site, and you know Bob's your uncle. But then come over here, you start with having a Finnish site. Maybe you do a Swedish one because in Finland they speak Swedish and Finnish. 
So then you have, okay, well, I have the Swedish site. I could go now to Sweden. And then on top of all of this, on top of kind of like the need for all of this, at the same time, in the Nordics, I see a lot compared to in other regions, very, very much pride in consuming from local brands. So mm. it is a very big additional thing for you to feel like I am buying from a Finnish brand or a Swedish brand. So that even makes it harder then because you you kind of you need to reach out of your own borders because you need to grow. But at the same time, we already know that wherever we go, there's going to be, you know, a Danish version that's their favorite or a, a Norwegian version. So there is a lot of competition, even though the market is very small. Hmm. Well, uh, that's fascinating, slightly worrying and fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, when do you, I mean, we were um, uh, in Copenhagen uh, the other night for um, one of our networking dinners. And um, I was struck by the fact that, uh, you know, when you're having uh, sessions in either London, Berlin, even Amsterdam, mm -hmm. there's a feeling that retail is very tough at the moment. Um, but there was more of a buoyant feel uh in the people we met anyway at dinner in the region so um w when we consider the background of uh you know ukraine the current conflict in the middle east supply chain problems high inflation post-covid there have been quite a lot of um of challenges to the consumer sectors um what is your view on um, the Nordic market as a whole, we see it as being kind of carrying on. I mean, growth has slowed, but there's still growth there. There's still confidence there. Um, is that how you see it? And do you want to uh, maybe give us an idea why that might be? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in this case, of course, I wouldn't want to sort of um, make any any like grand assumptions on on bigger uh, mm -hmm. bigger parts of uh, of the market um i do see something which is just i mean uh, we talk about it in in the nordics as kind of being a type of grit that we have towards just like surviving i mean i don't know if it has something to do with the cold winters we face every year the the darkness of it all um, but I think historically we've sort of known that we are maybe a bit outside the center of where everything is happening and that will require a lot more, a lot more work. Um, on the other hand, I mean, being located, uh, in a, you know, in this kind of area where you, you still have very logical ties to your neighboring countries. Uh, I think that means that people have been able to, uh, to really keep their business, not have to like scale back as much. Because it's still very, you know, it's, it's it would be very different if we had a, a a Central European company going, for example, after the Asian market. There's a lot less connection there, making it a lot more. Okay, there are bigger markets also, but I think what I've seen with the Nordics is that a lot of people just tell me that you know, even in these tough times, someone is going to continue trying to grow, and it might as well be us because then when the tough times get better, which I think we all hope that they do and things calm down in the world, then, you know, someone is going to pop up and most likely it's going to be your competitor who's going to pop up and be like, well, we continued to fight through this. Like we mm. continued to make investments. And so I think that's what we constantly see is that people, there is a competitiveness. We're, we're very, we're very sport focused people, for example, sports is very big, like say ice hockey. Finland, Sweden, ice hockey, that's a legendary matchup. Uh, and so, you know, there's always that bit of competition between these countries. And I think that kind of shines through as well. It's like, well, you know, if we don't do this well, someone else is going to do it and someone's going to find a bit of budget. So we might as well just like crack on now. I love that. Uh, so I think our next, uh, our 2024 uh, edition should be called Nordic Grit and uh, see if that works. Um, well, let's have a look at the so. um, at the companies um, now. So again, just uh, just an overview. Um, we oh. uh, we track and rank the top one thousand best performing retailers and brands in Europe, and with the Nordic one hundred, we looked at those, uh, and these are the top one hundred uh, across the Nordic um, region, um, and it's quite interesting. Uh, when you look at um, the categories, 
uh, of sales. So we're seeing that um, a lot of the best performers are in consumer electronics, fashion, uh, and homeware, but with a significant showing in sports and leisure. So that, that was quite interesting. And um, the two pie charts at the bottom, uh, we can see that retailers are around 68%. Uh, brands are 22%. And these are brands selling their uh, goods direct with their own branded sites. And marketplaces represent about 10% uh, by number. But yet, when you look at the traffic of where the consumer uh, is actually pointing her web browser, um, we see that the retailers slightly under-index, um, as ironically do the brands, and the traffic is going more and more to the marketplaces. Um, now, this is something we see reflected uh, across Europe as a whole. Um, if we take the top 100 across Europe, then 85% of the consumer traffic to that cohort is going to the marketplaces. So in a way, the retailers are still in a stronger relative position in the Nordics, mm -hmm. but um, that's still quite a shift. So why do we think um, that the marketplaces are so attractive uh, to customers? Is it a case of you know, product availability, um, delivery, or is it maybe back to your point, uh, Michaela, on product discovery, and finding the right things more easily than trotting around retailers. Do you have a, a thought on that? I mean, um, again, I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. We really do love our marketplaces. I've I've been um, I've been in a lot of discussions with marketplaces who are you know they are far far bigger than any of the big brands or retail sites. Uh, I think there's a a multitude of reasons really. One one is that you know we are um, as an area, which a lot of parts of the world right now are, but we are very into, you know, recycling, making things, um, making things uh, so that they last for, you know, future generations. I also think it is uh, a part of just the actual product availability. Uh, and, mm. you know, there's a lot of things that when they come to mm -hmm. When they come to the Nordic market, for example, it might come a lot later um, or, you know, something never was properly sold on the Nordic market because it was a brand from somewhere else. So you try to get those things on the marketplaces. Uh, and then also just like the ease, we still have a lot of a culture where, you know, you you sell something on a marketplace and someone shows up after work, walks to a front door and comes and gives you gives you the cash or, or sends you sends you the money and, and, and walks away with, with the goods. So people are also selling through these marketplaces very, very much. There's very much mm -hmm. this like neighbors selling to neighbors. Um, and I think especially this, this really shows when it comes to, to uh, you know, homeware, interior decor, uh, when it comes to, to children, things like that, you know, they grow up very quickly. It just, there's just very much more of a culture of like, well, I'll use this for a while. And then I'll let, I'll make sure that I can find that next owner who can really enjoy this this product. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, good. So uh, before we dive into some <clears throat> examples that uh, that we've liked, I should point out that in the report we list the top one hundred, um, and it's broken into uh, the leading twenty five. So these are the ones that stand out as being the uh, the upper quartile. Uh, top 50, and then the top 100. So I've, I've put them there in um, alphabetical order within their cohort. Um, but before we look at uh, individual retailers, one of the things that, um, that strikes us, of course, is the number of uh, global leaders that um, we see coming out of the region. Um, I've put Lego in here because who doesn't love Lego? Uh, but we also have, um, of course, uh, you know the uh, the powerhouses of IKEA, H and M. Um, we were talking the other day uh, in Denmark with the guys at Pandora. Uh, you know, one of the world's biggest jewelry companies. Uh, the enormous turnover, <laughs> international operations, and so on. So there's a lot of innovation um, coming out of the region. Uh, as interesting, uh, you mentioned, Michaela. 
uh, about sustainability. And it is interesting to us to see how much of the activity is very uh, is focused on sustainability, but in a very on brand way. So you know we've had um, IKEA, for example, who uh, have launched the Atelier One Hundred program, um, mm. where they bring every year they bring a cohort of uh, artisans or small scale uh, manufacturing retailers who. Uh, all are within 100 kilometers of the store. Um, and the store they opened recently in London, they're actually using the shop fittings and the cladding and the interior um, fit out material from uh, a store they bought in central London. And rather than just rip it out and put it in a landfill, they're taking it out, then repurposing it in another store. So it's little things like that. Lego, for example, with their uh, efforts at you know finding this balance between um, longevity and uh, quality with sustainability, but even while they're trying that, things like their um, brick clubs and rental offerings, uh, they're they're taking um, old bricks to um, give them to people, uh, maybe in schools or education. Uh, the launch of their braille bricks. Uh, for people with, uh, you know, visual challenges or blind people. Um, incredible innovation. Everywhere you look, um, mm. every week they're doing something interesting. So um, mm. and a lot I could just of... maybe, I could just maybe mention here very quickly, just when you said Lego, that's truly one of those brands that we see really flying off the marketplaces. It is like even personally, you know, we have... Facebook groups with people who live in specific areas in Finland, for example, and you sell things secondhand. Uh, and I mean, the Legos, they are just like ripped out of people's hands just because, yeah, yeah still generation after generation, it seems to be something that just connects with people. And then at yes. the same time, I think it's an amazing testament to just how uh how well they 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 stand the test of time really like how how wonderful it is that you can have so many so many kids playing with them and then they can just go and and uh and bring someone else so much joy yes so well, I should we say really it's not not see, yeah. not just kids uh in case no. of other people who uh, no. are also struggling through their uh, lego origami tree set uh which mm, they were given yes. for a birthday i have the orchid Mentioning... it's very pretty i have the orchid ah, i've got pretty. the little japanese uh japanese the bonsai tree. exactly Oh. But it's a, a couple of thousand tiny brown things, which, <laughs> anyway, no complaints. We love it. Um, yeah, we is this something, do you think, in the spring clear Nordic waters that combines this sense of purpose uh, and you know, innovation, which then somehow can work globally? Because, you know, when you look at someone like an IKEA, um, there aren't... I can't think of many homeware stores that are so dominant outside of one continent. Uh, and if you think about supermarket stores, there are very few supermarkets that, mm -hmm. even though they are domestically beyond brilliant, regionally powerful, um, you don't have, for example, Tesco's or Sainsbury's in the Nordics. You don't have Kroger uh, in Denmark. You know, it, there are very few brands that manage to really resonate on a global scale, but um, yeah. your region has a couple of them. And unlike, say, the French, Italian luxury brands, um, you know, these are very much you know, big, uh, complex operations saying complex products. Mm. You know, um, any, any thoughts on why that might be, or is it just, uh, just a bit of an accident uh, in Sweden in the middle of the last century? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's an accident. I think a couple of things come to mind when, when, uh, when you raise that point. Um, I think first is that something that we see very in common with, if you think of the likes of IKEA and Lego uh, and the H&M group, is that there are very clear market fits that they have. Uh, I think this is something that might tie 
we 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 could tie this back to to looking at just the region you know since you need to be able to expand quite quickly outside your own country you're likely to have done a lot of research and making sure that you know you have your you have your icp you know where you fit in the market you know your your value proposition you know what you want to bring forth and then they have a very clear messaging from the get go uh people's sort of view of you know what you can get from ikea is is uh, is pretty similar around the world as is lego for example uh so i think that's really one thing um that you know there's clearly been a lot of work being done at a very early stage because you needed to know that this messaging can translate to three four different countries very quickly uh another thing i think we see is that if we look at uh from a a human standpoint if we look at um at culture at workplaces at how we focus on working together as people you know bringing that good nordics is often um celebrated for for the work life balance that we have the ability to to take parental leaves and things like that so if we look at a lot of these companies are also those companies that you would read about when you read about like uh really excellent company cultures and i do think that has something to do with it as well is because we know that you know happy happy people build build really successful businesses together so um and lego is is one of them that is often mentioned yeah for happy customers as well so with all this happiness um i just wanted to pull out a couple of the examples uh and the case studies from the report um not because they're better or worse than each other but because of some of the uh, more interesting questions I just wanted to um, cover with you. So this is quite interesting, the uh, uh, talk money um, business. So um, for us, it's interesting looking at this and seeing the growth of a general discount retailer that very much focuses on you know, pricing as being uh, an offer. Um, so over the years, this has been a bit of a roll-up. So when you look at the company history, you can see that uh, they've bought up and um, aggregated individual discount players or regional um, chains. And again, the way that they managed to balance um, their own brand mm. products, which are obviously cheap, good value, but with um, also branded products from uh, consumer electronics uh, brands as well. It's quite an interesting uh, approach as if they are, you know, taking on the whole world in order to bring um, cheap pricing. But what I liked about this, I was very impressed with, is how they then um, say at the same time we're really focused on safety, testing, quality, transparency of sourcing, and even opening up uh, their factories, labour practices, suppliers um, to be validated uh, by a third party. So. Yeah. This to me seems like something quite distinctive, which is this you know, focus on price and range, but also on quality and transparency. I, I was very impressed with uh, with that combination. I mean, I, I love what Talk Money ha has done. I mean, it's a Finnish company, you know, they have um, they have a very good uh, online store, but they also have very good brick and mortar presence. Uh, I think especially in Finland, I know that people can be quite skeptic, skeptical. So, you know, you have a very, uh, if you have an affordable product, the first question is, well, what's wrong with this one? Um, <laughs> and uh, I think what Talk Money does great compared to a lot of other that we could consider more discount uh, retailers is also that they have a very standard set of product catalog. Of course, it changes throughout the seasons. Now I'm going to be able to start buying things for, you know, um, for the snowy winter that's coming in the warm summer, I can buy something that I would want on the beach. But I think what is really important and what's really good that they have done is that they have a set of products that they always offer, meaning that a lot of people have created their shopping, uh, their their shopping, uh, their shopping journey, so that you know going there is mm -hmm. a part of it because we know that we are going to get those specific products from there. And then it's, I think they've done a, a great job in the branding side of things. We have, um, they run TV commercials here, for example, and 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 one of those commercials is usually about the um, the, the the 
person, the, 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 the character, Mr. Talk Money, and how he goes out to the world and then he starts negotiating for getting, you know, um, Colgate toothpaste by the truckload. Yeah. And, and how everyone is always so amazed that he managed to come back and, and, and make a deal. Uh, so they yeah. really like they really created this persona of of someone who wants to bring people good quality, good, good quality, price, but a deal, yes, yes. And now that he's create now that they've created this brand, it means that I think a lot of times um, I might not even check the price compared to you know my local store just because in my mind I have a feeling that you this so is associate it. Yes, exactly. I so associate yeah. it. So that's where I go for the laundry detergent. Yeah. Excellent. I, I noticed as well when I was um, uh, looking at our research that they, uh, with their Chinese uh, sourcing, they've partnered with a uh, Norwegian discount group, uh, Europris. Um, so that's quite an interesting regional link up as well. You're know, getting that mm. scale collaboration uh, with somebody else in the uh, in the region too. So. Um, Again, just coming back to some of the themes uh, you'd mentioned um, earlier on. Uh, now, let's jump to uh, Boost. And uh, so, you know, we know they're, they're big, they're interesting. But, I mean, what a journey they've been on, including some U-turns of, you know, we are just this, we don't want our own technology, we do want our own technology. So it's quite interesting to see how um, that's grown. The things I want to pull out... <coughs> Uh, with um, Boost was this very interesting um, product life cycle approach where they they're primarily online and becoming if you like the the main online department store uh, mm. so they have the boost so they have the um, boostlet which is an online um, uh, sort of discount outlet mm. and then if that doesn't work they now have the physical store which on their website they say, this is for things we didn't manage to sell online, online at discount, so we're giving it one more go in store. And I thought that whole sort of um, mm -hmm. you know, product life cycle journey uh, was really very, very interesting. Um, and uh, the other thing I thought uh, is uh, intriguing um, is how they are adding more and more digital capabilities. So... Um, you know, given that they have such a large uh, presence now, uh, we see they've got um, and, and their own technology stack, which they're really leveraging. Uh, I was interested that they have done a sort of Amazon, uh, not Amazon, that's a bit unfair, but uh, you know, optimizing their operations with their fulfillment centers. And recently, you know, this last year, have started using their data and their traffic around um, retail media with the uh, Boost Media Partnership. So you can now um, you know, advertise on their site and you know, run it more as a, a retail media proposition. So a, a lot of innovation there where they seem to be simultaneously customer and category focused, but also using their technology to develop new capabilities to exploit their scale. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I I um I couldn't really speak for. I mean, I can speak for myself and say that I have seen seen this trend at least in the in the Nordics compared to to the other regions I worked in. So, not so much maybe familiar with with the uh, with the American uh, region or with APAC. Uh, but it is very interesting to see that these sort of really really big sites, these really big players on the market, they can still be completely in-house driven, basically. So they, they can still be those that really do most or all of the innovation on their own. I mean, you can still go on a site and 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 realize that that you can't recognize a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, a public open source e-commerce platform or anything like that, that it's all sort of built from the ground up. And <clears throat> I think a part of that is, yeah, we have a lot of people who are quite, uh, you know, technically minded in the Nordics. Those kinds of educations are very popular over here. But also maybe just the fact that, that we did have some pretty, uh, pretty sort of 
strict requirements on on what your technology should be able to provide you just because of mm -hmm. the location and the language so maybe yeah. it wasn't even a question of going out and actually shopping for something as a service it was just sort of a well we're going to do it ourselves mm. again maybe coming even back yeah. to that kind of mindset of you know we're up here in the north all alone we're going to do it ourselves <laughs> Well, um, one thing you don't always think about uh, with the North is swimmer and laundry. <coughs> but I did want to um, highlight Nelly.com. Um, really, as part of, um, well, I think a couple of things that uh, I like to So firstly, the uh, emergent nature where it had come from a younger demographic uh, who wanted uh, you know, to combine, if you like, the material excellence uh, in the region especially on cotton and uh, so on, with a younger uh, a younger set of styles. Um, but I like the fact you know, how it's grown via social, uh, how it's got this membership, uh, I, I would say community, because I'm probably getting a bit too carried away, but definitely a membership affiliation um, mm. model. And, and that's allowed them to grow now uh, beyond um, the original swimwear lingerie, to include beauty and a broader uh, clothing and accessories option. So again, um, you know, this, this really speaks to the younger demographic, uh, to a sense of style, but also building um, a community, um, taking uh, into consideration what you'd said before, which is you have multiple languages, um, you know, a really big and, uh, you know, characteristics change across the region um they've done a very good job i think of uh of being able to grow i think uh, when we looked at it last they had about two 2.4 million uh members on nelly.com uh, an enormous social following is you know, well over a million um they're doing quite a few things right uh, is there anything that um you know when you look at them you think haha they're doing a good job um that's an exemplary an exemplar for for the region. Um, maybe not so for the region. I think one thing that I think Nelly.com does very well is the fact that they are very they stay very current. So they've really understood that uh, that when especially when the younger demographic when they take so much, you know, the the world isn't anymore like. Even we've even even though we've spoken about us here in the Nordics being kind of like secluded away, it's still not. It's still a couple of clicks away on a smartphone, and so you know the the inspiration that you take for things like fashion, it it's not anymore mm -hmm. coming from you know your hometown or the people that you go to school with. It's coming from all over the world, and that is something I think Nelly capitalizes on very well. Is that they're very very quick to redo their designs they're very quick to pick up on trends and make sure that they offer that nelly branded version of these things so mm. i think they are they're they're really quick on that which is really great and um i've also worked with them previously in terms of things like affiliate marketing for example so they are very well known they have a lot of sort of tentacles out there that are sources of customers um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, I think a lot of the times really, uh, it took, a, it took a long time for shipping in the Nordics to become something where you felt that it was worth the wait instead of going to the store, because here, you know, I mean, if I shop from Europe, I can regularly still see seven day shipping, uh, even seven to 14, which for me, I think that's, wow. that's that's really a long time. I mean, I, I'll I'll have forgotten what I ordered, or I'm not. I'm I've, I've gone off it by the time I received the package. Whereas I think Nelly is also done well with that. So clearly, the logistics of it work mm -hmm. because you can still you get your your parcel in a couple of days. Um, and then, I mean, I think it's just it's a fact of the fashion industry that people when they can't go into a store and actually try things on, they are going to order more. And then, and then actually, you know, try on at home and then send some things back. And I think yeah. that's also uh, one part that Nelly does really well is that there's clearly an element of follow through in also the uh, return. So they are really right. asking you, why are you returning this product? Is there mm. something we could have done better? Uh, and feeding back really good things such as, you know, was the sizing correct on this or not? So, so mm. they, they are doing a lot of things really well, I think.
Excellent. Well, look, um, time is uh, running out for us, I'm afraid. Um, I think one of the things that we've been discussing internally is that given the market has been stable uh, with you know, a, a, a modicum of growth, uh, for ambitious um, retailers and brands in the region, they are increasingly going to be needing to look outside the region to sell uh, into Europe and globally in order to um, get the growth uh, that they want. So this is something we'll be looking at um, even more next year uh, to look at the the growth in cross-border. Um, but as you look to uh, 2024, uh, what do you think um, is either going to be our top topic uh, in the webinar next year or that we should um, focus our research on? Um, what, what, what's your top tip for 2024's focus? So I think what we're seeing now a lot is really a um, it's really a, an effect of what we were really excited about in the e-commerce business during this year and end of last year, which is the trend of going towards a more composable architecture, towards going with the best of breed kind of services, uh, really picking out the ones that fit your needs and then connecting all of that. And so that discussion kind of started. We already have we already have a lot of big brands who have made that shift. We have a lot uh, who are planning to. I think if this uh, if this um, if this trend would have come up at a time where we didn't have so many challenges with global economy, I think that shift would have already happened because, of mm -hmm. course, it's not you know it's 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 not free to to make these kind of technical changes. But what I am seeing a lot right now is kind of the aftermath of that. So now we have. We're starting to use all of these different services. So now we're all about actually connecting the data from all of these different parts. And that one then ties again, I think, very interestingly into not only that we have a bunch of data, we expect our service providers to offer us the technical uh, possibilities of actually connecting that data. But now it's a question of, well, how do we use it? Is it, is it actually you? Is it actually like viable for us to connect it or are we just doing it because we feel like we have so much of it mm -hmm. and at the same mm -hmm. time we have consumers kind of drawing away saying like no i want my privacy i don't want to share my information how are we going to bring that really personalized shopping experience when we have people actually moving away saying like no i don't want you to build a profile on me i don't want you to know what i ate this morning um i mean a spoiler alert for anyone who is who is interested there are things like you know, clickstream uh, segmentation, personalization stuff that we do at Clevu, for example, that I'm really excited about because I think that's really what people are going to need is a way to create personalized shopping experiences without having to compromise Without privacy. having access to that data. Good. Yeah. Well, look, we've managed to get onto data, privacy, uh, real time. Uh, yeah. So we're not going to be short of things uh, to look at. But, uh, Michaela, um, as our time runs out, massive thank you to you, especially thank for you. joining us um, uh, on your recovery. Really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, so, do our, uh, so do our participants who are pleased that it wasn't uh, just me on this <laughs> webinar. So thank you for bringing your insights. Um, really appreciate that. And um, we've mentioned a couple of reports. Some of you will have joined the webinar because you have read the report um but in case any of you are due the other way around and have uh, got a <coughs> webinar first don't worry uh, we have the um report uh, available for you you can download it but if you're watching this in real time in november then don't worry we will mail you the link uh but if this is later sometime in the future on youtube uh then you will have to click on it or find the link uh in the text below um but we will send it to you and of course do send us your thoughts so uh if there are areas you'd like us to look at in more depth um if you're a retailer who's thinking why am i not a case study the answer to all of these comes uh by dropping me an email uh, research at retailx.net. Uh, we'd love to chat to you, hear your thoughts, uh, and help us uh, continue our research into this uh, fascinating region. So uh, with that much said, a final thank you to Michaela. Thank you to thank everyone you, for lending us some of your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the studio again. Thank you very much. Thank you.